All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center. My name is Rustin Lippincott. And no, you are not going crazy. It is not Thursday. You guys didn't notice. Yes. Okay, don't tell Darian Sloat. I was supposed to do this. I did it at 645. That's what happens when you procrastinate. You put Thursday instead of Wednesday. So it is Wednesday. Anyway, we'd like to welcome you to the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center. This time we'd like to invite the candidates, Michael Halley, Connie Boyer, and Ed Noyes to make their way to the stage. And uh, I think it's great that, uh, that this many people come out and uh, care about the direction of our city. So thanks for coming. Welcome to the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center. This time I'd like to invite or er, introduce the moderator for tonight's forum. You know him as the man behind the pen. He was, came here five years ago, six years ago. He's, he's a heck of a guy, he, he, he bleeds Fairfield. He's the deputy director of the Southeast Iowa Union. Please welcome Andy Hallman. Thank you, Rustin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2019 Fairfield Mayoral Candidate Forum. I am your moderator, Andy Hallman. Tonight's forum is brought to you by the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce, the Fairfield Economic Development Association, and the Southeast Iowa Union. Joining me on the stage are our, our three candidates vying to fill the seat vacated by Fairfield's outgoing mayor, Ed Malloy, who has held the position for the last 18 years. The candidates are Connie Boyer, Michael Halley, and Ed Noyes. Members of the audience will have an opportunity to ask the, the candidates questions. If you have a question, ask an usher for a pen and note card, write down your question, and the usher will pass the question to me. Questions cannot be directed to just one of the candidates, and they must be relevant to the role of the position being sought. All three candidates will have a chance to answer every question, and they will have a minute and a half in which to do so. Our timer in the front row, Nikki Sabosky, will indicate when a candidate has 30 seconds remaining and when it is time to stop. Each candidate will have three minutes for their opening statement. Our timer will hold up cards indicating when the candidate has one minute remaining, 30 seconds, and when they must stop. And we will begin with Connie Boyer. Connie, please give your opening statement. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for coming tonight and organizing this event. My vision is working together with you to grow Fairfield's long legacy of successful business, entrepreneurship, farming, arts and culture, and higher education. My family of six generations has recognized the great place that Fairfield is to live, work, and raise a family. We want to honor this tradition as role models for the next generations. I've served as a Fairfield City Council member and Mayor Pro Tem, served on many boards, including this board here at the Civic Center, co-chaired the Go Green Commission, and was a member of the 10-year strategic planning. I am currently on the Fairfield Library Foundation Board. I've started three businesses in my career and was CFO of Iowa State Financial Services Corporation, which owns Iowa State Bank and Trust, and worked there almost 24 years. I currently work as a financial advisor with Edward Jones. I believe Fairfield has a tremendous untapped resources. And how do we tap into that and use that? First, we listen extend our friendliness and respect in order to team up to get things done. Let's wisely use our hearts and minds to get things done together for our community and for our mutual benefit. We'll get more into details as we go along tonight and I look forward to sharing with you some of my ideas. The job of May mayor is local, nonpartisan, doesn't vote, <clears throat> And one of the great things that we have the opportunity to, do, opportunity to do is finding those mutual goals that we can agree on and uh, work towards accomplishing those goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Connie. We will now hear from Michael Halley. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight, despite the weather. I'm Michael Halley, I'm running for mayor because I love Fairfield. I moved here as soon as I was old enough and able, as age of 18, came from a small town in Ohio. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been on city council. So 10 consecutive years, I've served on every city council committee. I've been the mayor pro tem for the last two years, and I've completed the Iowa League of Cities municipal leadership training. So local government is my passion. It's uh, where I pour my heart and soul. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a growth mindset. I'm always trying to be better today than I was yesterday. Uh, I am a very direct communicator, so sometimes I have rubbed people the wrong way by being extremely blunt, but I will not lie to you, and I will not tell you things that you want to hear in order to get your vote or your support. So I'm honest to a fault, um, and I, uh, I like it that way. Uh, in terms of my background and leadership, I was uh, the board president for the Fairfield Visitors Bureau for three years, the Fairfield Volunteer Center for three years, and the Chamber of Commerce Board for two. So I've chaired a lot of meetings, and um, I work in a consensus building fashion, solution oriented, I really don't like bickering. So uh, when I'm chairing or in charge of a group, we work towards solutions and it would be the same for the mayor position. The priorities I've set, I've kept them short, uh, the list short, because I want to focus in on things that I know we can get accomplished and make some progress forward. Uh, top among them is attracting and retaining working age citizens here in Fairfield. Our, uh, our businesses are poised for growth, but they're having a heck of a time getting younger people to come and stay here. It's uh, difficult for people to put down roots in a new town sometimes. I worked with the, um, the young, young professionals of Fairfield to try to help kind of a welcome wagon, and uh, we need to do more of that kind of work. Uh, some of the obvious things, we obviously need to work on our housing. We need to offer more high-quality, affordable housing options. Obviously, also, we've got to fix our roads. I would like to see the city double down on our complete streets policy that I brought to the council in 2015 and making streets not just safe for vehicles, but also for cyclists, pedestrians, and the disabled. And um, last but not least, I'd like to see more attention put on helping those who need help the most. We need to address food insecurity in both our children and elderly. We need to address homelessness, drug addiction, mental health, all those things we don't like to talk about, but we need to shine a light on them and to get the resources to the people who need it most. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We will now hear from Ed Noyes. Thank you, Andy. Uh, my name is Ed Noyes, and I'm honored to be here tonight. Fairfield is a blessed community in so many ways. And the first blessing I want to recognize is the service of Ed Molloy, 18 years He's been our mayor, and in those 18 years, we've accomplished amazing things together. And so I was hoping he was here tonight, but apparently he's not, but I just want to thank him for his service. And in a beautiful way, the way that Ed retired is another blessing to this community. If he would have continued to run, we wouldn't be here tonight. We wouldn't be having this vibrant discussion. We wouldn't be talking about these visions of Fairfield. And this is a very competitive race. And Mr. Halley and Ms. Boyer are amazing people. So I want to thank him for, Mr. Malloy, for, for this gift of leaving when he did. It's really a class act the way that he did it. Finally, I want, to, I want to acknowledge that we're blessed by the people in this community that have volunteered themselves at all levels of government, uh, the teachers, the administrators, the amazing service organizations we have in this community. Um, they've do, been doing this forever and ever and ever, and including the people on the city council. And in particular, I want to thank Connie Boyer and Michael Halley for their years of service. They've demonstrated uh, that through the time that they've put in, and they are completely deserving of our respect and appreciation. The next blessing I want to acknowledge is the people that are here in this room and the people of our community. 
In many communities, people feel powerless and they don't, they become despondent. You know, in this world of government uh, abuse, people don't feel empowered. But in this community, we do. And that is a major blessing that we still have that hope within us. Mahatma Gandhi said, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. He recognized that the role of a real leader is to inspire all of the people to lead themselves and to bring out the best of everyone. And that's what I intend to do as mayor. So I want to thank you for the incredible contribution that the citizens of this community have given, and I know will continue to give. We all want the same thing. We want to be able to raise our children so they're happy, loved, and successful, and prosperous. We want a clean environment. We want all these good things for each other. We can have these things. We can create this. I'm telling you, we can create whatever we want. And I'm committed to the vision of everyone belonging, everyone feeling loved and supported, and the creation of a community we can all be proud of. I look forward to the discussion tonight of how we can accomplish these worthy objectives. Thank you, Ed. Uh, we will now begin the question and answer segment of the forum. But before we do, I just want to remind everyone, if you haven't done so already, take out your cell phone and set it to, to vibrate or silence it, please. And now, the first three questions that I will ask, the candidates uh, have received ahead of time so that they could better collect their thoughts. And once again, the candidates will have 90 seconds to answer this question. The question is, the city will publish a new 20-year comprehensive plan before the end of the year with major goals for infrastructure, zoning, sustainability, job attraction and retention, and housing. How will you lead the city government and community in accomplishing goals in these areas? And we will begin with Michael Halley. So the first step, is this on? The first step is to start a new strategic planning session. So a comprehensive plan is mostly a land use plan. Uh, our comprehensive plan is more compre comprehensive than, uh, than any prior plans. But a strategic plan is where you set your objectives and develop steps to reach those objectives. Uh, our last strategic plan is expiring in 2020, and it's time to engage the entire community in the process. So the first step is gathering input. And I believe this step needs to take more time than it has in the past because we want to gather input from people who aren't used to being asked for their input, particularly the young and uh, sometimes the poor as well, people who don't have a lot of status and aren't typically invited to be on these kind of boards. So we take our time and we reach out and we get as much input as possible so that we develop a plan that, that has an impact on as, much, as many people as possible. We don't want to cater to a certain group and burden everyone else with the expense of large projects. So um, strategic planning, uh, I think that in 2020 we can develop a plan and we set five-year goals, 10-year goals, and then we review those annually to make sure we're on track. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, uh, Ed, we will move on to you. Would you like the question repeated? Sure. Okay, the city will publish a new 20-year comprehensive plan before the end of the year with major goals for infrastructure, zoning, sustainability, job attraction and retention, and housing. How will you lead the city, government, and community in accomplishing goals in these areas? Thank you, Andy. If we're gonna be looking at 20 years, we need to start with a vision of who we want to become. And if before we can recognize that vision, we have to look at whether we have the right to create what we want. Do we have this inalienable right? The largest political issue on earth right now is where do rights come from? If they come from God, then citizens have the right to create the government they want. There's forces out there that would try to impose upon us what they believe we should have for our community. That is incorrect. It's not the nature of inalienable rights that was gifted to us by the founders of our nation. So if we recognize that we have the right, then we have the responsibility and the duty to do something with that right. What would we do if we could create anything? I would start with creating a world-class education for our children. The unfortunate part is, is the federal government has created a program that has dumbed down education throughout America 
to the point where only 37% of the children can even read. We have the right to embrace environmental purity, which we can do. We should be open to creative ideas to make Fairfield an irresistible place to visit and become a highly prized tourist destination. Once people get a taste of who we are, they will want to move here and our, our prosperity will continue to prove, improve. We need to encourage those who want to live off the grid to right, be able Adam. to do that. Ed, thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks, Jenny. We'll move on to Connie. Connie, do you need to have the question repeated? No. Okay. Fine. So one of the first things I want to do is step back and look at the previous plan and the pre previous strategic plan. And let's find out what we learned from that plan of what didn't work so well and what worked well and why. Because we'll want that knowledge going forward. I really want the community to be involved in this plan and to know what it says. And that, to me, that means that we have some community um, uh, presentations. and. Because the plan is very uh, extensive, we might do that over two or three sessions. We want buy-in by the community of what's there. We create a strategic plan. Uh, in one strategic plan, we had a strategic plan and a go green plan previously. Those need to be in one plan. And I want to remind people that this is a living document. So even though it's the, the comprehensive plan is set for 20 years, we also know that it's a living document that can be changed as needed. I would like to identify experienced individuals in certain areas and certainly organizations who will help the implementation of the plan. And also like to set up what I'm calling the Fairfield Forum, where we can bring more knowledge to the community about key issues. We have issues that people care deeply about here and, but we also need more knowledge about those issues. And I've got several people that are very interested in participating in that. All right, thank you very much, Connie. Thank you. Uh, on to the second question. Over the past 15 years, the city has worked with community partners to develop the Arts and Convention Center, the 16 mile loop trail, the downtown facade restoration, the outdoor pool and Cambridge Sportsplex, and multiple commercial and residential development projects. What opportunities do you see for public-private partnerships in the future, and how would you engage in those efforts? And Ed, we will start with you. Thank you, Andy. Well, we have an amazing opportunity, and that is to um, exit out of our relationship with Alliant Energy. We are incredibly situated to pull this off, having two of the best solar companies in the state, we have advanced technologies. We have the Sustainable Living Department at the university. We can do this, trust me, but we have to have the courage to look at it. We have to get into the facts, and we have to see what we can do. We've got time to do it, and we can do it. The next thing we should be doing is engaging the university and all of those amazing programs they have out there into partnerships with the community. It's unbelievable what they can do with their computer science program, again, the Sustainable Living Program, Blockchain revolution is happening right now. That can bring amazing jobs to this community, and that could be all done in partnership with the university's computer science program. We definitely should create a mentorship program that allows anyone within the community to have access to the knowledge and technology. We can bring the generations together, save the seniors from feeling they don't have a purpose, bring them together with the young people. There's so many things we can do, but they only give me 90 seconds, so thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ed. Um, Connie, we'll move on to you. Uh, the question again was, over the past 15 years, the city has worked with community partners to develop the Arts and Convention Center, the 16-mile loop trail, downtown facade restoration, outdoor pool and Cambridge Sportsplex, and multiple commercial and residential development projects. What opportunities do you see for public-private partnerships in the future, and how would you engage those efforts? I want to say that FIDA and the Chamber have been great partners in many, many ways, and that absolutely needs to continue. We do need to take an inventory of our city property, its use, and its value to the city. So I think there are some city properties that maybe we could divest of and work with developers to uh, put up new housing. Could be, could be duplexes, could be quad, it could be apartments. Um, I think we should t look at community development grants for um, our neighborhoods that need upgraded. 
I think a volunteer center, bringing back our volunteer center, making it sustainable so that we can really use that and use mentors, people who want to volunteer, grant writing, neighborhood organizations. I'd like to see some citizen advisory boards to help with areas that we have issues with. For example, our, our, our rental housing. Um, and uh, other property issues and, and drug issues. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, would you like the question repeated? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think we need to pause. I think uh, 18 years of um, expansionism and adding expensive amenities has caught up with us. We have high property taxes to pay for those amenities, and we should take a break and reassess. And uh, we can look in our strategic plan for opportunities to add amenities when the dollars make sense. Uh, we have a lot of uh, debt coming off the city tax or the city uh, debt service in 2022, so we can look at some street re repair work with that. But we'll still be paying for we as in all the property tax payers here in the city. We'll be paying for the uh, the new sportsplex until 2034. So we got to think this through and make sure we're spending our money wisely. Now there are types of amenities that don't cost the taxpayers money. For example, Petra's Park is being privately developed and then once developed, will be handed over to the city. That's an excellent amenity to add because it didn't cost any of us any money. The uh, new playground equipment at Howard Park was also privately funded, and I think those type of amenities, the sky's the limit on those. If there are people who have the money to give and the desire to give, yes, thank you, we'll take it. But we're not gonna uh, necessarily burden the taxpayers with more expensive amenities. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, on to question three, and we'll be starting with Connie this time. Fairfield's population has grown by 9.4% since 2010, and the new comprehensive plan projects further growth over the next 20 years. How will you prepare the community for growth, and what are the key strategic pieces that need to be in place for growth? Connie? So some of the key things that need to be in place, some things we've already talked about, affordable housing, our land use planning and our infrastructure needs to expand our city limit, excellent child care for working families, incubators for new business. I personally would like to see a kitchen incubator, incubator building, creative arts. We need to, Fairfield, we need to keep Fairfield Arts and Convention Center open. Our park and recreation has some deferred maintenance that, that needs to be taken care of. I think we want to look at our local option sales tax and see do we need to make any adjustments there. I'd like to see also uh, downtown fast, fast electric car chargers, because I think that's going to come here sooner than later. And we also want to build a sense of positive civic duty to hire and train and make sure we're buying locally. We need more affordable activities for our children and our teenagers. Our young families want that. So we need to figure out how to provide that for our young kids so we can keep our young families here. So that's a matter of collaboration with the community, um, organizations taking on some of those, and uh, collaborative efforts with citizen advisory boards. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, once again, Fairfield's population has grown by 9.4% since 2010, and the new comprehensive plan projects further growth over the next 20 years. How will you prepare the community for growth, and what are the key strategic pieces that need to be in place for growth? So not all growth is equal. Some of that 9.4% are transient members of a population who aren't here to establish themselves and not even here to contribute. Uh, there are people from Illinois who have found a, a loophole where they spend time in Iowa, they get on our, um, our aid programs and then go back to Illinois. And you can ask the school system and the police department and our food pantries and they will corroborate that that is true. So if we want to grow the community, we can do a shotgun approach and just say we want people or we can be strategic and say we want people who fit the needs that we have. And the needs we have are working age people to fill our jobs and people to put their kids in our schools. We can get in a really quickly into a negative feedback loop in our schools where as the enrollment drops, funding drops, which means the programs get worse and enrollment drops further. We don't wanna see that happen. So if we're talking about population growth, you gotta be smart about it. City of Des Moines did this, we can do it on a smaller level here, where you strategically target a younger population to fill the gaps in your workforce, 
and to grow your population by reproducing. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, Ed, um, how will you prepare the, the community for growth? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is protect what we already have. Uh, we're, we, have we are gifted in this community of having some of the most amazing organic agriculture, some of the cleanest water and air. We've protected ourselves from the influence of CAFOs. We must continue to do that. We must recognize our rights to govern ourselves. We must, or these forces will continue to come into our community and diminish the quality of our life. We also must transform our educational system so that the children grow up realizing their unique contribution and that they're loved and cared for. If they get that and they feel a part of the community, then they will want to stay because, because that's not found. It's a rare thing to have that. So it's very important that we do that. We need to, we need to uh, allow the vision of the youth to be actualized. They have great visions for sustainable living. They want to live off the grid. They want to live a beautiful lifestyle. They want to have low taxes. We can do all of these things, and we should do it, and we must do it if we want to continue to grow. And the, another key is the expansion of tourism. We need to toot our own horns and expand the beauty that we already have. People will come and they will move their lives here and we will expand our wealth. All right, thank you, Ed. <clears throat> this time we will start with Michael. And this is a, an open-ended question. So Michael, from your perspective, what is the role of the mayor in city government? Well, I can tell you my perspective. I could just tell you what the city ordinance says and the state law says. The mayor is the chief executive officer for the city. And uh, that might sound like there's power there, but really there's not. The mayor signs, um, signs laws into, into action, but only the things that the council has already acted upon. So the council holds the power. The mayor is more symbolic. The mayor also is that that bridge between the city government and the community at large. So the mayor has an influence in that uh, that person can go out into the community more and, um, and synergize with other organizations. The mayor has no say in anything the school system does, not what the kids eat for lunch, not the classes they go to. That is a completely autonomous organization. The city is not involved in the school system. So the mayor's roles are rather limited. Uh, for me to go from a council member to mayor would be losing my vote, which uh, would be odd. I think that uh, it takes some getting used to. But there would be uh, more opportunities to engage in the community at large and, um, and really find some partnerships to get things done. All right, thank you, Michael. Ed, what is the role of the mayor in city government? Well, Michael's correct in many ways, but the mayor his main role is to hold a context that nourishes the entire community and includes everyone. He must have a vision for the community because without a vision, the people will perish, as it says. So the mayor is, should be an inspirational person that brings the best of the community together and brings out the best in everyone and ensures that, yes, the education system is what it should be. This can be done through inspiration. It's not a mandate, but it can be done because everyone wants the best for the children. Once we bring knowledge together and we bring uh, inspiration together and we come together as a community, we can create anything, trust me on this point, but we must have the leadership and the vision to do it. And that's what I believe the mayor's principal role is to be the protector of the community, to watch the future of the community, and to make sure that the community advances and that everyone gets to play their role and become the person that they've always wanted to be. That's what I think the mayor should be doing. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, Connie, from your perspective, what is the role of the mayor in city government? As the chief executive officer, like Michael says, I think that one of the major roles is to provide stability in our city government by leading the meetings, keeping your center. Sometimes when you're on city council and there's an issue that's challenging, you know, the emotions run high. 
And I think it's really important for the mayor to be able to keep that steadiness because people want that in their leader. The mayor also can set a vision, I think, and hopefully bring the community along with you if it's a good vision. And it's not, there, it's not the duty to tell you what to do, but, all, but to, by collaboration, hopefully we can make goals and plans together and then move that forward. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Connie. And Ed, this next question, will, we will begin with you. There is a common opinion that property taxes in Fairfield are higher than other similarly sized communities. How will you ensure property tax fairness and competitiveness in the future in order to attract and retain citizens and businesses? Well, you know, I've written about this and there are some uh, things that can happen with property taxes. There's called tax increment financing, tax abatements, et cetera. I'm actually not opposed to these things because if they are able to create something that wouldn't happen otherwise, then that's good for everyone. But I think like, for example, the abatement, the abatement should be for everyone. Okay, so we've had situations where people didn't improve their properties because they're afraid of the taxes. That's happened very much so. In order to reduce the taxes, we must increase our property tax base, which means we must create more prosperity building in this community. We can do that through a variety of ways. We've talked about that, bringing people to come into town, creating these sustainable living villages that the young people want, increasing our organic production, making it a net exporter of agricultural products. All of this is highly desirable and can easily be done. We're already doing it, but we're not, we're not doing it in the way that we could do it. And once we create a world-class education system, everyone will want to live here because this is the most magnificent town in America already. All right, thank you, Ed. Connie, there is a common opinion that property taxes in Fairfield are higher than other similarly sized communities. How will you ensure property tax fairness and competitiveness to attract and retain citizens and businesses? Well, I think uh, we have a lot of amenities, which has been great. We've been forward thinking. Now we have to build into those amenities. We, our population has to grow. and. Uh, to, you know, to build into that and to grow into what we have. One of the things that I'd like to do is really look at some of our neighbors that are similar sizes to us and really compare where that tax, dif tax difference is. I do ha know someone who has property in Fairfield and Mount Pleasant and she says definitely we're higher here. So I think an analysis needs to be done to really look at those differences and then look forward, try to, try to problem solve that. Thank you very much, Connie. Oh, let me, hold on one second, okay. All right, are we ready? All right, Michael, do you need the question repeated? No, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the simple answer is expand the base so that we're all um, paying a little less for the same amenities. The thing about taxes is if you compare only the property tax segment of a given city, you may miss other things like franchise fees or if the city has its own uh, electric utility like Mount Pleasant does. Cities with their own electric utilities oftentimes take profit from those and spend them in other areas. And so um, it's not necessarily apples and apples comparison if you just look at property tax. I've seen the list that compare us to other cities in Iowa. We're not really on that much of the high side, but we're not on the low side either. Uh, any candidate who tells you they're going to lower property taxes is overpromising. It is not an easy fix. Uh, the property taxes are assessed so that we can cover the city expenditures. The budget's set, then we look at what the assessed value is on all the property, and the levy rate is just that variable that gets us to our budget. If you want to lower the property taxes, you have to lower the budget. To lower the budget, you essentially have to fire employees, because that's really uh, what it comes down to is salary. So cut services fewer fire firefighters, fewer police people, close the library um, on certain days or the, the rec center. I don't think anyone wants to do those things, so property tax is not a simple uh, silver bullet issue. You gotta, you gotta grow the base and uh, share the load. All right, thank you, Michael. And 
Uh, uh, Connie, you'll answer this, uh, answer this next question first. The question is, do you believe that CAFOs pose a threat to Fairfield, and what steps would you take to protect the city from CAFOs built close to city borders that could endanger the quality of life and property values of city residents? And uh, CAFOs are confined animal feeding operations. <clears throat> I think one of the things that Fairfield needs to look at is the two-mile extraterritorial zoning. That helps protect Fairfield. It also, we can also zone so there's no uh, animal, you know, those buildings within that two-mile limit. I think that's very important to do. I'd also like to say uh, that years ago we talked about this when I was on city council. And, you know, I, I grew up here in Fairfield, so I know a lot of farmers in our area. And one thing that we have to remember is that many of those farmers, Fairfield is their town too, and they also want to protect Fairfield. Now, I'm not saying that they can do whatever they want. I'm just saying that, you know, Fairfield is their town too, and they want Fairfield to thrive as well. I think the two-mile limit is definitely something that we should look at, and that, that will be up to the council whether to move that forward. But I think that's one of the biggest things that we do to protect Fairfield. I will say I know that there's some research and development on CAFOs, and um, I look forward to some things that can help in that area, and hopefully sooner than later. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, do you believe that CAFOs pose a threat to Fairfield, and what steps would you take to protect the city from CAFOs built close to city borders that could endanger the quality of life and property values of city residents? Uh, yes, I do. And I would not look into the two-mile extraterritorial zoning. I'd act immediately to get the council to move forward with it. I've talked to our city attorney about it. He's ready to move. The council already actually adopted the first step years ago and just didn't follow through. It's the largest area outside the city limits that state code allows us to have any say in. It is not necessarily guaranteed to keep CAFOs out. I don't want to overpromise on that. Uh, it's a tricky situation, but our city attorney does believe that if we did zone it a certain way, we could keep them out of that area. We don't want to create unnecessarily strict zoning laws for the people who live in that area and enjoying their multi-use dwellings. We don't want to prohibit somebody who's got a little bit of uh, residential mixed with commercial mixed with ag to suddenly have to uh, stop doing something they're doing. So. It needs to be done carefully, but it would be something that the council would partner with the county supervisors to do. I think that the current supervisors would be open to doing that. And again, not making unnecessarily strict laws within that zone, but doing whatever we can to protect the investment that we've all made in this town. All right, thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, Ed, do you believe that CAFOs pose a threat to Fairfield, and what steps uh, would you take to, to protect the city from them? Well, I think it's obvious. I mean, if you study the quality of water in Iowa, there's a direct correlation between the, the basically horrible nature of our groundwater and the CAFOs, that's a given. We also know that the air quality is being diminished dramatically when the um, sewage is applied to our field, you smell it downtown, it affects the quality of our life. Now, there is an emerging uh, community rights movement that is a saying that the way to, to handle these issues is to form affirmative statements within the governments of your localities, saying this is who we are. We're here to create a beautiful, pure lifestyle. We're, we want to do this, we want to do this, this is who we are. And if you violate that, you're violating who we are. So by doing that, they're violating us. So I think that's an, one of the answers is to look at that as a possibility. Um, there's no question about it. I think there's, there's going to be real problems coming down with the CAFOs. We already know that one third of all hogs have died because of the lack of uh, antibiotic resistance. And so these things are already going to be phasing out. We need to continue to show who we are and point out the problems that are within these CAFOs. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, Michael, you will begin this, uh, this next series. MUM has been a part of Fairfield for 45 years. 
In your opinion, what's the current status of the inclusion of the two populations within the larger community? If you think it needs improvement, what would you do to facilitate further inclusion? That is a great question. Inclusivity is something that I really have been talking a lot about, and I think it's extremely important. A uh, community like ours, where there is still a bit of division, uh, you have to actively break down those silos. Whenever you jump into a silo that isn't your silo, so go into a group that isn't accustomed to you being there, there's friction. That's okay. We're a family. We can have a little friction and forgive each other. So uh, having been a student at MUM back in the 90s, I, uh, for my first year there, didn't venture into the city much and uh, realized that there's this whole other world outside of campus. And there isn't a whole lot of integration. I would like to see the university have some open houses on a regular basis, maybe a few times a year, invite the public, come inside the domes, see that it's not as weird as you might imagine it is, uh, and just break down those boundaries because we're all, we're all pretty much the same underneath the surface. And um, I will say though, my 26 years of living here, relationships between the city and the, the university are probably better than they've ever been. So that's, that's a real plus. I think that, that's to, uh, thanks to the young people. I think the young people are the ones who just don't like labels and uh, will take you as you are, regardless of, of what school you go to and such. So, uh, but we can do a little better. I'd like to work on that. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, Ed, MUM has been a part of Fairfield for 45 years. In your opinion, what's the current status of the inclusion of the two populations within the larger community? If you think it needs improvement, what would you do to facilitate further inclusion? Well, it's certainly gotten much better over the years. Uh, I've been here for a long time, and uh, I credit Mayor Malloy for some of this. I think as we get to know each other, then naturally those differences break down. I mean, at this point, half of my clients, I don't know if they're meditators or they're local. I don't know that. They don't care. I grew up on a small farm in Nebraska. I relate just as much to the locals as I do the meditators, even though I'm a strong meditator. And so, but I think one of the things we don't do, we haven't yet recognized the value of the university and what the university can bring. It's unbelievable what they can offer to us. The Sustainable Living Department can help us to create the best urban environmental program in the nation. They can do that. They can help us, they started with the tiny home movement, they can expand that. They can help us create these villages that the young people want. Knowledge is power, and when that knowledge is applied, and we can apply that in this community, it creates prosperity for everyone. So, and that's gonna benefit everyone. Just as the solar industry has benefited everyone in this community, more and more of using and applying these technologies and the knowledge that the university develops is going to bring us all together and create prosperity and love within the community for each other. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, so, Connie, what would you do to facilitate a further inclusion between the two groups? can do is involve individuals and organizations and bring them together to working on common goals. You know, it's never perfect, right? Um, there's, there will always maybe be a little division, but also I don't see that really any different than other small town that has a university. If you talk to those towns, there's this little thing between the town and the university. It's, it's, it's just part of it. Um, I think it's gotten much better over many, many years. Um, I think we just focus on where we want to go and uh, focus less on that there's a division. Bring people together when they know people. Years ago, one of the things that Susan Kessel and I did, which was a lot of fun, was we interviewed people uh, for the local FPAC channel. And um, because we realized that this person over here might never get a meet you in, in their normal daily life. So we would bring people uh, on TV so they could see who they were and then go, oh, well, you know, I kind of like that person. They're really interesting. So the more that we do of that and the more we focus on togetherness, the less that, that will drift off. All right, thank you, Connie. And then, Ed, we will begin with you for this question. Uh, this is about downtown traffic. Between 2015 and 2017, 
five different state and destination marketing organizations have recommended two-way street restoration in the downtown as a method to improve safety, simplify travel, and strengthen the economy of downtown commerce. Should the city at this time invest local option sales tax funds to restore downtown streets to two-way traffic as opposed to one-way streets? Yeah, I've been asked this question before. Or, I'm not sure this is working. Is it working? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've been asked this question before, and frankly, it's above my pay grade. So, I mean, I'd be happy to look into it. I don't know it's the most important thing we can do. But, you know, if we look into this and we think it's a good idea, and it's not going to cost too much, and we really think it'll work, then of course we should do it. All right. Thank you, Ed. Um, Connie, do you believe that the city should invest local option sales tax funds to restore downtown streets to two-way traffic as opposed to having one-way streets? Well, let me say I'm not convinced one way or the other at this time. Um, in some ways, I think it'd be nice to have two-way streets. In other ways, people say we've got other bigger issues that we need to deal with, um, and we should take that money, even though it's not a huge amount of money, and put it towards potholes or something else. Um, so I think there are a couple issues that, and they were just recently brought to my attention, is that um, on Burlington, we may need additional turning lanes. So I think that's something that we overlooked, and I think that needs to be studied a little bit. What's that cost? That would certainly add a cost to that. Um, and so my understanding is that the city council will be receiving alternatives. So before I say yay or nay, um, I think it's we have to look at what are the alternatives. Are those more important right now uh, to spend the money on those things? And we should delay this a little while if these things are more important. So, you know, I don't have a big feeling one way or the other, but I just I do know that citizens are telling me that they feel like it's unnecessary. But I also know some of our downtown merchants really would like to see it. So I think we there's a little more research to be done, a little more information we need before we can make a major decision. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, uh, do you believe that the city should invest local option sales tax funds to restore downtown streets to two-way traffic instead of one-way streets? Yes, I do. Uh, I was with the Visitors Bureau Board. I'm on the Wayfinding Commission. This has been looked at in depth. The Burlington lane that would be a turn lane is currently nothing. It's just adding some stripes. It's, uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, the streets were two-way from the start of the city up until 1967. 55 blocks were converted to one-way because uh, Parsons College went from 1,000 students to 5,000 students, and a lot of those were young men driving fast cars. One-way streets are designed to move traffic quickly away. Downtown is not an area where you want one, fast traffic, and two, people leaving quickly. You want it to be a destination. Court Street, those businesses have struggled for decades. It's unusual and unnatural when you're driving on Burlington, if you're not from Fairfield, that you can't take that left turn on the court. 84% of cities that have um, uh, city county seats with squares have two-way streets. So people coming from out of town are just expecting it. Uh, it's not changing it to something it's never been. It's just fixing a problem and, and kind of correcting a mistake that was made many years ago. Of those 55 blocks that were converted in 67, all but the nine downtown were converted back five years later. I, uh, I'm speculating that the ones that were left were just because they didn't want to pay for restriping the, uh, the parking spaces. So yeah, I'm in favor of this. I think it's a wise investment and will really help our downtown a lot. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, Connie, we'll start with you this time. The position of mayor can be more about vision and character than perhaps intellect or opinion. What would be your weaknesses in this job, and how would you counterbalance those weaknesses in order to be an effective mayor? Tough question. Um, well, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that because I haven't been on city council since 2013, you know, I would have to do some catch up on some details. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, also, I would need to make, well, okay, um, 
make connections, particularly with different organizations within the town that maybe I'm not as connected with right now. So I think that's important. Um, but I overall, I'm not really concerned about that. Um, so, you know, there's some things I would say in the manufacturing area that, that uh, you know, I don't know all the detail on, but I'm not worried about catching up because I know a lot of those owners of those companies and it would be a matter of just uh, asserting myself and, and uh, talking with them. You know, these are people that I've grown up with, so I'm not really worried about that. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. So Michael, what would be your weaknesses in this job and how would you counterbalance these weaknesses in order to be an effective mayor? Well, it's no secret that I can be intense at times, uh, something I have been working on. I grew up in a, in a family where there's a lot of conflict and uh, you, know, you bring that stuff with you into your adult life uh, despite your best intentions. And it it's, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to, to get it out of there. Uh, you, you, know, you might think you made progress and it's kind of like pulling a weed, but you didn't get the root and it comes back. And so I've done a lot of digging and trying to get those, those, uh, those roots of, of that kind of behavior out of my system. I think about sometimes the way I behaved in the past um, during certain stressful times and know that I could do better. Um, I don't know if it was something about turning 40 or, or just being tired of of fighting with people, but these last five years, I feel like it is really not so much of an issue for me, but uh, it's something definitely uh, that I need to continue to work on. If you ask my friends at floor hockey, that's, uh, they'll tell you that I do sometimes lose my cool. Uh, they might say I lose something else, but you know, I, I sometimes get competitive. And um, I'm aware of that, and uh, I feel like they say that when a child is born, that the parent is born as well. And so there is an aspect of you know, being sworn in as mayor that you kind of uh, grow into the role and you mature into the role. And I, I think that I would do that. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Ed, what would be your weaknesses in this job? And how would you counterbalance the weaknesses in order to be an effective mayor? Well, they say your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. And one of my greatest strengths is I can be extremely focused. But in that extreme focus, I can think I know everything. And I recognize that. Uh, I was blessed with a father that had this unbelievable power of will. He did things that five or 10 men couldn't do. But I was also blessed to have a mother with a heart of gold. And together they gave me uh, this vision of the, of the full man that I'd really like to be. And when I'm engaged in my heart, which this job, I believe, will do that for me, then I'm a better man, and you can help me be a better man. Um, it's my goal. All right, thank you, Ed. And then, Michael, we'll start with you this time. How would you increase the city revenues for the general fund without raising property taxes? Or, on the other hand, if you think the city needs to decrease expenses in, in the general fund, where and how would you do that? Wow. That's a loaded question. Um, the general fund, just to back up a little bit, it is funded through property tax. That's, that's its major revenue source. Whenever the city raises fees, such as the lawn mowing fees, we're accused of trying to take people's money it doesn't add up to much, um, you know, and the police fine you. We get a little bit of that, but it really is through property tax. It's an area I'm not going to make any promises on. It really, everybody would have to come together and decide collectively if we're going to take off some sort of service so that we can lower property taxes. And every time I talk to people, I've not heard a single person, aside from a few, few fringe people who would want to see our services diminish. And so uh, I use the analogy that Fairfield is kind of like living in that little bit swanky apartment complex that has the, the gym that's open 24 seven and the hot tub. You know, we have these amenities and we pay for them and we pay for them through our property taxes. Uh, there's no simple solution here. It really comes down to if we want to cut them, we cut city staff. Uh, we've really run out of efficiencies uh, in the city government in other ways. So, um, 
I'm not going to make any promises on the campaign that I can't keep in office. So that's as much as I'm going to say on that one. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Ed, uh, do you think it's possible to increase city revenues for the general fund without raising property taxes? Or, or on the other hand, if, if you think the city needs to decrease expenses in the general fund, where and how would you do that? Well, one of the blessings that will come when we increase tourism is that people will come to Fairfield and they will spend their money. And we do have sales tax revenues that can be generated from that. The entire state of Florida functions without a state income tax. They, get, they, they live off of their sales tax because of all the tourism that is in Florida. So I really believe that we can do that. The other thing we need to do is we need to liberalize the Airbnb laws so people can come here and there's a tax associated with the Airbnb. So we've, we've interfered with the natural desire of people to come and, and, and be, actually get to know us in the community rather than sitting in a hotel over here, don't get to know anybody, kind of look on what's going on as a part of actually being in someone's home that shows them around and they get to know the people. And then the homeowner gets to make money off of that too. We need to change that law. That needs to be changed. So, and we can be very creative, trust me, we can dramatically expand tourism in Fairfield. It's not even that hard to do. So once we do that, the sales tax revenue will significantly help us with the city budget. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, Connie, how would you re increase the city revenues for the general fund without raising property taxes? Uh, or if you think the city needs to decrease expenses in the general fund, uh, how would you do that? I'll have to agree with Michael. Um, the only way to really increase that general fund is to grow our tax base. That's population. That's building buildings. Um, and so much of the general fund is salaries. Now, to give you a little history lesson, when I was on city council before, one of the, and, and budgets were tighter than they are now. We were using the emergency levy. Um, we're not using that now, which is a great thing. Um, but we propose to go to a volunteer fire, fire, uh, fireman instead of having full-time firemen. And believe me, the community told us, no way. And we heard it loud and clear. And it's those kind of things that, yeah, you can cut, like Michael's saying, but it, it's, it's services and people. And um, we... The community didn't want that before, and I don't think they're going to want it now. So to me, it's, it's to grow it, to grow Fairfield. All right, thank you, Connie. And uh, Ed, we'll start with you this time. What is your position regarding city tax dollars used to support non-governmental, non-profit entities that provide services that benefit the city and increase property or sales tax revenue? Doesn't sound like a good item, idea to me. I think if the uh, nonprofit entities provide real value, they will get contributed to. I think that's fundamentally true. You know, if you give value, you receive value. So if their mission is big enough, people are going to naturally want to contribute. I don't know that we want to pick and choose and decide who we're going to give our city dollars to. I believe that this has been done in the past, and I think there's been big problems with that uh, because the dollars end up becoming. Um, who gets the dollars, and then it's it's just it's open for graft, and it's not a beneficial thing. You know, Marcy said that competition is for the competent. He meant that if you have something of value, then you will be successful. He wanted people to be successful. He wanted us to be competent and not just have things given to us. So I don't necessarily believe that's a good idea. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, Connie, what is your position regard regarding city tax dollars used to support non-governmental, non-profit entities that provide services that benefit the city and increase property or sales tax revenue? I think those have to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Most of that comes out of our local option sales tax when that happens. And I think it's important for the city council to evaluate what their mission is, what they're doing, and the value to the city as a whole. And if it has a huge impact to the whole, 
and it comes under community betterment, then, then maybe that's okay. You know, I, th I, think, I really think it's a case-by-case -case basis. All right, thank you, Connie. And Michael, do you need the question repeated? No, thank you. So um, every year, the City Council Ways and Means Committee uh, receives grant applications for local option sales tax grant dollars, and those are only available to nonprofit organizations. And they give it a, a look over, and then they bring a recommendation to the council. And so every year, it is reviewed, and uh, it's not always the same people asking or same organizations asking, but some of them are kind of regulars. And it is looked at through a lens of what's the ROI. So if we invest this money into, say, First Fridays, well, that could be a, uh, a draw for people from out of town, and then that can grow local option sales tax. One organization that I feel the city does need to fund is FIDA, Fairfield Economic Development Association, and simply for the reason that a lot of cities have their own economic development branch within the city government, and Fairfield does not. And the work they do is extremely important, probably of any local nonprofit as more directly beneficiary to growing our community. Um, now, in terms of taxes, if you had a house, that adds a minuscule amount of property tax. But if you had an industry, that adds a lot. So uh, I would say FIDA should be in its own category of always be receiving funds from the city. And then the others, we just continue to look at each year. All right, thank you, Michael. And Connie, this next one will start with you. What are your plans to support LGBTQ community of Fairfield? LGBTQ youth are particularly vulnerable and could use the most support. Can you please speak to this? Well, one of the things I mentioned before is I think we need some activities and places for young people to congregate. Um, and I think that's a community effort. So I would be supporting uh, the community and try to pull together people who are interested in that topic and uh, bring them together and work on that together as a community. As far as, and I just want to add, as far as the city's concerned, I think my job is to make sure that all employees are treated fairly with respect and um, that you know, there are no issues related to LGBTQ in our, in our city employment. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, what are your plans to support the LGBTQ community of Fairfield? LGBTQ youth are particularly vulnerable and could use the most support. Can you please speak to this? Yeah, this is an issue that's near and dear to me. My eldest child is uh, transgender, and I know the challenges that he's faced. Um, in terms of kind of the, the harder answer, the not the hard isn't difficult, but the more um, practical is that the city facilities, and as in our park and rec department, we're, we're funded um, through public funds. And so we have to be very uh, non-discriminatory in that way. And so that can make some people uncomfortable if someone who is transgender is using a different restroom. But at the same time, we can't discriminate against that. And so. That kind of thing is uh, something that our former city administrator and I discussed, and, and um, we just don't have a right to discriminate, nor should we. And then on another level, it's just also including uh, that group in um, our planning sessions and just making sure that there is some understanding of what, what that group represents, why, um, you know, why some people choose to transition, and I can tell you from my son transitioning, uh, I love him just the same, nothing changed, a pronoun changed, his appearance changed a little, but uh, if it's your child, the love is the same. And so if I can love my, my child the same way, then, then we can love everybody the same way. Right. Thank you, Michael. Ed, would you like the question repeated? Yeah, please. Okay. What are your plans to support the LGBTQ community of Fairfield? The LGBTQ youth are particularly vulnerable and could use the most support. Can you please speak to this? Well, I believe that every, every individual is entirely unique, and every individual has the right to be exactly who they want to be. So, 
and I don't believe we have any rights whatsoever to discriminate against anyone for choosing who they are. And it's not just the LGBT, it's the people that have Down syndrome, it's the people that are mentally impaired, it's, you know, I mean, we have these people, they're all over town. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the elderly that they, they can't think anymore, you know, they, they, they don't really think well. So really what this is about is having a context where we respect each other and we love each other and we honor each other and that's how we deal the situation. We deal, we do it with love and respect. All right, thank you, Ed. And uh, Michael, this next question will be, will begin with you. The U.S. Census Bureau recently updated its low to moderate income data, indicating the city of Fairfield now has over 52% of its population in this category. What role, if any, does the city government have in addressing this fact? It's something that I've been talking a lot about in this campaign, and city government doesn't have a lot of resources to spend in this area. It is mostly handled federally and somewhat state and a little bit county. So it's not something that the city can just start spending money uh, to solve. However, if we're gonna do a new strategic plan, uh, making the goal of Fairfield being a truly caring community, I believe should be one of our top goals. And we talk about the prosperity of our community, but it hasn't reached everyone, obviously, by these statistics and the fact that more than half the kids at the schools now are on free, free or reduced lunch. The only way to get on free or reduced lunch is to prove that you're in a certain income bracket. So there's a lot of poverty in our community. I hear stories, I've talked to the director of the Lord's Cupboard, our food shelter. I hear stories of a single mom. She came to get her first box of food and was moved to tears when she saw how much it is and said, I haven't eaten in three days so my daughter could eat. That's our community, that's in our community. And if we don't address those kind of things, who are we? Why are we here, what are we doing? So uh, it might not be the city's role, but it, it sure is the community's role to, uh, to help uplift those people and, and help them become self-sufficient. The U.S. Census Bureau recently updated its low to moderate income data, indicating the city now has over 52% of its population in this category. What role, if any, does city government have in addressing this fact? Well, I think this is a direct byproduct of our failed education system, which we've already talked about. The Common Core curriculum dumbed down the children so that they all pass. That has created a crisis of education. The children are not taught about their individuality. They're not honored for that. It should be about excellence. It should be about what they want. And if they become the best person they can be, then their, their ability to earn is gonna, mac, is gonna actualize. So it is a byproduct of our education system. I don't think that statistic is unique to us. I think this was probably a statistic that is common throughout the country for the reasons that we've already discussed. But we must care for each other. And that's what extended families are about. And this, our community can be one big extended family. I think if we come together and we get to know each other better, and we see the needs that we have. There's no reason why we can't help these people. Young people today, they don't even know how to work. It's a tragedy. They don't enjoy their life. They're depressed, they take drugs. All of this is a byproduct of them not becoming self-actualized. That must be our first priority. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Connie, the U.S. Census Bureau recently updated its low to moderate income data, indicating the city now has over 52% of its population in this category. What role, if any, does city government have in addressing this fact? So first of all, I think we understand what are the root causes. And I think some of the root causes are there, it's generational. Um, some of the things that have been mentioned, I think some educational skills, our teens can also learn educational skills through different activities. 
Um, and it may be a recreational activity, but we need to connect them with an educational field that they might be interested in. And also, it's so important to keep them off drugs, because once they're on drugs, it becomes a problem and they end up being in, under the poverty level. But what can the city do? I think one of the important things that we could do is provide, through our volunteer center, people who want to help, match them with a mentor, excuse me, match the mentors with people who want to rise up. They have to want to rise up first. We can't do it for them. I think everybody knows that. Um, so they have to want to, to rise up. They have to want to get out of their situation. They want to want to get out and have a better life. And there are people that want to help. There are people that have energy to help and that can provide and help them problem solve and, and um, make their life better. I think that's one of the things that the city can do. All right. Thank you, Connie. And uh, Ed, we'll start with you this time. What initiatives and projects can the city and county work on together, and why? you have any ideas? Well, you know, we are an agricultural community, and I think we have a unique opportunity to expand, um, to provide products that everybody wants, premium quality vegetables, organic, locally raised, is there's a, there's a super premium on this. You know, it's recognized now that cancers are caused by, which is obviously an epidemic throughout the entire country and here locally, to the presence of pesticides and all these things that are in the foods that people eat. We already do this, but what we don't do is we don't recognize how amazing it is. I think we could dramatically increase our agricultural production of these, of these products. We can create a distribution system so that we can sell these products. We can value add these products. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of wealth that we can create in this community by providing the high quality foods that everybody wants. There's an unlimited demand for this product. All right, thank you, Ed. And uh, Connie, um, what initiatives or projects do you foresee the city and county working on together and why? I think most of the uh, things that we work on together now, including FIDA, the ambulance, our police and sheriff's departments, the library, Fairfield Arts and Convention Center. There are many things that we're already doing together. I think it's a matter of always reassessing those. I don't have anything new and wonderful to, you know, a new program or anything like that, but I think it's good to keep that, that uh, relationship between the two entities strong and uh, working on the, on the same goals and uh, communicating together. When we're doing something, we let the county know. When the county's working on a particular something, we're working on it. Because there, there's actually many times when we have to show joint support if we want grant funds. Um, so it's really keeping that communication open and uh, working uh, more towards the things that we're already working on, I think. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael? First and foremost, the two-mile extraterritorial zone would be the first project that uh, the city and county would work on if I were elected. Um, aside from that, uh, it's actually been great. I'm looking at my friend Darren Hamilton right now to have somebody who understands city needs on the county supervisors. I feel like uh, there's already been improved communication and, and cooperation. I actually hosted the county engineer at City Hall for a meeting to discuss a road that's kind of a county city split. I don't know if that's ever been done before. Something that simple is just having uh, city and, and county officials uh, interacting in that way. I've worked with the county public health department on some wellness initiatives. That's where I learned about uh, food insecurity in children. I didn't even know what that term had meant. And there are a lot of resources the county health department has for everyone in the cities, including the county, that um, most of us are unaware of. And I think that more facilitation and cooperation to get the word out of what's available could really help our population here in Fairfield. 
And you know, the county is there to serve the entire county, including the city. So um, we can do more collaboration, but specifically with, with the, uh, the health issues after we get the territorial zoning. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, Connie, we'll start with you this time. Alliant Energy and the city of Fairfield have an electrical service contract that is up for renewal in about two years. The comprehensive plan includes looking into converting to a municipal electric service. What is your position on the city continuing to use Alliant Energy or pursuing converting to a municipal electric service? What action would you take and when to ready the city for the end of the contract with Alliant in approximately two years? I know that the city would like to look at a municipal utility. Um, this issue should have been addressed several years ago, knowing that the uh, contract is gonna be coming up. So it's gonna be hard, very hard, to turn us into a municipal utility in a couple years. So the only thing that I see that we could do is look at a shorter contract. Uh, with with Alliant, and that could be challenging as well. It's a very difficult situation, um, and a very uh, it's a very big issue. And um, but we would want to get on it right away and uh, see where you know where we could go with it. Um, I do I do and I'm challenged by Alliant pushing us to do things that maybe our community doesn't want. And that comes up with smart meters, right? So I opted out, and I am concerned about the health, and we can take that over to 5G, about um, our privacy. We are the customer, and that's one thing that Alliant has failed to recognize, is that we are their customer. And that's been a bit frustrating. Um, so it's a, it's a very challenging issue, and I, you know, we, we can't do it in two years. There's a lot of study that has to be done. And it's very expensive to do also. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, what is your position on the city continuing to use Alliant Energy, uh, or are you in favor of pursuing uh, a municipal electric service? I'm in favor of exploring uh, a municipal electric utility. It would be the single biggest project the city had ever undertake. It would almost double the number of employees that we have. We have 60 some employees right now. We'd probably have to have at least that many on, on hand. Um, the problem is that the Iowa Utility Board, which is a three, board, uh, three member board appointed by the governor, has the final say if a city wants to become its own electric municipal utility. And no city has gotten uh, the green light in the last 20 years. The city of Decorah got very close and they had a vote that was just simply to allow the city to explore it further and it was voted down by just a handful, of four or five votes. Align Energy will spend a lot of money to fight this. They don't want to lose us as a customer. Um, I've heard some talk about the city going to a rural co-op, which is not an option for us. Um, the city is either uh, provided by the investor-owned utility in the area, so we don't have a choice. It's either Alliant or it's a city utility. And uh, there's a long process to doing it. The more we talk about it publicly, the more um, Alliant has uh, time to formulate their, their counter. So I'd have preferred to have done this quietly and explored it quietly before it was talked about, but it seems like the cat's out of the bag now. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, Ed, uh, what is your position on the city continuing to use Alliant Energy, and are you in favor of switching to a municipal electric service? Yeah, I've watched this uh, very carefully and closely since uh, I've lived here for 34 years. I was around when basically Iowa Southern Utilities was bought out, and uh, Alliant basically took it over, Interstate Light and Power. Um, once they were given the right, they said they wouldn't increase for five years, then they increased dramatically. They recently caused for a 25% increase in the general fee. They said they needed that to install the smart meters throughout the state. Um, I think they're extremely arrogant. I think we can do much better. 
I also think that we could uh, institute a blockchain technology. If people understand what this means, it has the highest degree of productivity that you can imagine. For example, Walmart took them seven days to do their inventory. Once they adopted the blockchain, they could do it in 3.7 seconds. The blockchain allows for what's called an immutable a ledger where we can see everything. Every single penny can be seen. We would all be members of this. We could all self-govern it. There's much we can do. Yes, uh, I think we can do it. I think once again, it's an opportunity to work with the, line, or the university and also the people from Decora who really wanted this badly and they were outspent by Alliant and they barely lost. Right. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. U.S. Cellular has announced that they will be deploying a 5G signal in Iowa and Wisconsin in 2020. They plan to broadcast the signal from the three current towers they own and not deploy small cell antennas throughout the city. Some people are concerned about this new technology adding to the so-called electro smog in the city and have concerns for the health of our citizens. The federal government and state government have limited the control over local uh, Citing. What will you do to ensure that Fairfield can have a say in the deployment of this new technology? Well, as you said, the city's hands are really tied by these preemptive laws. It's more and more common for industry to approach a state and go to the state legislator and say, we want to unroll our technology in your state. It will be a lot easier if you just pass these preemptive laws that prohibit local governments from having their own say and how we do it. And with 5G, it was passed unanimously in the State House. So that's all the, all the legislators said yes to it and left very little authority with the city. The city Council just recently passed our, what we could for small cell facilities. And as soon as we're passing it, we find out that US Cellular has plans to use their existing towers, which is a very different type of technology than what we were planning on. 5G was talked about as high frequency waves that don't travel far, hence the need for many small towers. This is something entirely different. It must be some sort of longer wavelength, but still 5G. So uh, we did have a gentleman come to council and he explained that 5G can mean a lot of things. So uh, understanding what it is, but really understanding what our rights are, I think is, is first and foremost. If there is something the city council can adopt beyond what we already have, to at least keep these out of residential areas, at the very least, then we should act on that immediately. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, so, Ed, the same question to you. What will you do to ensure that Fairfield can have a say in the deployment of this new 5G technology? Once again, this is the fundamental political philosophy issue that uh, needs to be determined throughout the world, and that is where do rights come from? The community rights movement would say that we do have the right. We have the right independent of what a, of any other government can tell us about this. I do know that Mill Valley recently used their city council to pass legislation that limited the implementation of 5G. It's already been done. We also know that there's very serious danger warnings that have been put out by institutions such as the Scientific America, which is the, the longest running publication in our country. We've had people say that it can be very serious, can cause all kinds of uh, cancers and other depressions and mental issues and sleeping deprivations and all kinds of very serious issues. What I would propose that we do, since it's clear, there's never been studies that's proven that it was safe, that's a given even though they might say that's never been done, what we should do is we should, we should pass some form of thing at the city council, some kind of resolution, that we oppose 5G until we've had time to study it. It's very simple. And then let's have the time and let's see what it comes out to. We can't just stand silently and let them do this to us. We cannot. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, Connie, what will you do to ensure that Fairfield can have a say in the deployment of this new 5G technology? I think Michael gave a good uh, you know, position of where we're at now. Um, I do think one of the things that we educate our citizens through is what I call the Fairfield Forum, where we have some experts up here, 
and they talk about what the issues are. We educate our citizens about what it is. The citizens then decide what they want in their community. They go to their council members, discuss it. If the council wants to say and pass a resolution, like Ed said, if they want to pass a resolution that they're opposed and they want it studied more, they're concerned about privacy and health and provide some very clear backup with why those things are concerning to them, I certainly, as a mayor, would sign off on that resolution. I think it's okay to slow things down until we know for sure, but it's gonna be a challenge right now. There's no question. All right, thank you. Thank you, Connie. So we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Ed, with this next one, we'll start with you. What types of new businesses do you think would be best for Fairfield? Please give reasons why for your answer to the above question. Well, we start with what we already have. We already have one of the finest uh, natural health systems anywhere in America, so we should expand that. Everyone wants to be healed. People will come to Fairfield to be healed. When they come here, they'll experience how amazing we are, our silence. They will fall in love with our restaurants, our art, our music, et cetera. They will want to move here. That will be a natural thing. I've already spoken about tourism. That's a very good idea. We can do it by, through some creative advertising things and things that we do that make us special. Pella did it with tulips. We can do it with dahlias, as has been suggested. We can also do it with the City of Angels project, which has been discussed. Finally, uh, people don't understand this, but the blockchain revolution is the greatest opportunity that's anywhere on the planet. There are companies right now that will train people that into coding for blockchain in 30 days, and they will earn, they say, anywhere from $75 or more per hour within 30 days. The technology is that powerful. The demand for those coders is going up 60% a year. We've got a ready graduate program at the university. So it's something that I'm exploring and I really think it's a tremendous opportunity. All right, thank you, Ed. So Connie, what types of new businesses do you think would be best for Fairfield? Well, this isn't a new business, first of all, but I think one of the things that we do is we tell our family members that are not here, our young people, to come home. Bring their families and come home. That's been a very successful strategy. Um, doesn't mean necessarily Fairfield, but people who are from Iowa. When they have children in other states and grandparents are here, it's a very good draw to bring them home. So I think we need to work on that. Um, I think another thing that we could do is individuals who are self-employed, um, uh, that have a light footprint, so to speak, on the resources they use in our town, I think we should try to, to attract those people. You know, because people can work now from all over the world. And, uh, you know, because we have the internet, right? They can, uh, you know, and we already have a lot of people doing that. They work for other companies, but they work, for, work from here. And so I'd like to see us attract a lot more people that, that do that and have, don't take up resources. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, oh, can I add one more thing? Okay. Sorry, forgot Within this. Within your time. Um, I mentioned a kitchen incubator before, because I think we have a lot of businesses um, and a lot of ideas in the food area that I think we could grow here. And I think if we had a kitchen incubator, a building that had several commercial okay. kitchens in it, that right, could happen. thanks, Connie. Okay, sorry. Thank you. All right, Michael, uh, what types of new businesses do you think would be best for Fairfield? Well, we have a lot of manufacturing. Um, we don't have a lot of tech, and tech doesn't mean um, manufacturing tech. Tech can be basically computer programming, marketing. I know of a firm that's doing really well, and what's wonderful about some of these businesses is they bring us international money into Fairfield. So uh, the businesses that can bring the funds from outside the community here are always a godsend. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see more retail. We have a pretty, pretty uh, strong downtown, but a little bit more here and there never hurt anyone. That could be actually an outgrowth of community of uh, strategic planning. The strategic planning isn't just for the city, it's for the community in general. And when 
We identify needs, such as places for young people to spend time, uh, internet cafes kind of thing. Then the entrepreneurs out there can see an opportunity in a niche and then act on it. So uh, it's very common for businesses to wait until there's some sort of evidence that there's a need before they'll invest. And so I think we could attract more downtown businesses and more of those, those startup companies that Fairfield's so famous for that are involved in information and technology. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And this will be the last question of the evening, and we will begin with Connie. I've heard Fairfield referred to as a glorified retirement community. I did not say that. <laughs> what will you do as mayor to assure me that our town will attract and maintain a younger population? Well, I think many of the things that we've already talked about we need affordable, diversified housing. You know, I've heard people say, I came, ho came, ha came home, but I couldn't find the right housing that I wanted, so I had to settle for whatever they settled for. So that uh, needs to be worked on. Uh, I'm hearing from young people, they want activities for their toddlers, um, that what we have is not quite enough. And we need activities for older children as well. So those are critical things that we need. Um, you know, my own daughter complained and said, there's not enough for my kids to do here. And I think that was, you know, if you go to a bigger city, they have a lot of free things for the kids to do and for the families to do. So we don't have quite those amenities. So we have to get creative in that area. Um, certainly they gotta have jobs and they, they have to be well-paying jobs. So that's a matter of working with, um, you know, our, our businesses here and, uh, that partnership with FIDA is so vital to grow our businesses because that's where most of our growth comes from. All right, thank you, Connie. Uh, Michael, what will you do as mayor to assure me that our town will attract and maintain a younger population? You speak in my language. This is something I've been talking about from the beginning of my campaign. It's a frustration I've had serving on city government for 10 years, often being the youngest person in the group. Um, I love the fact that we have such a, an engaged and vibrant retirement age population. I did see an advertisement at a, for a, an event earlier this year that was entitled Make Fairfield a Retirement Community. Uh, it's fine to have a retirement community in Fairfield, but we don't want to make it a retirement community or else we'll be in real trouble because of all the things we talked about before, we won't have people who are filling the jobs that need to be filled and putting their kids in the school system. So I took a, big, a lot of inspiration from Des Moines. Now they're a bigger community, but they turned themselves around. They were not a place that young people wanted to be at all. They were actually just the brunt of jokes. And uh, they turned that around. Now they're, they're in the top five best places for young people to live in the country. They did it strategically. They did it intentionally. You have, to, you have to target certain types of projects and certain types of amenities specifically for that group. It's not excluding others, it's including young people. So again, it's inclusivity and it's not an either or, it's an and. Yes, we'll take care of our seniors, but we also will attract and retain young people and that's gonna be one of my top priorities if you vote for me. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, Ed, what will you do as mayor to assure me that our town uh, will attract and maintain a younger population? Well, first of all, young people, if they grew up here, they kind of want to get away. You know that. The issue is, are they going to want to come back? Now, that depends on how they were raised. It also depends on the quality of life that we have here. Many of the young people go away and they, oh my God, it's so much nicer in Fairfield. So again, I'm gonna come back to the educational system. This is something that we can do. It's not even that difficult. In today's information age, we can make world-class educators available to every student. If we raise them in the way that they feel loved and they're complete as human beings, then they're gonna to wanna to come back. You know why? Because they're gonna to wanna to raise their own children here. That's why they will come back. And in, in terms of bringing other people here, I've talked to a lot of young people. They love Fairfield, but they wanna be able to have the kind of life that they want. A lot of them are into the sustainable living. They wanna live off the grid. They, you know, Maybe they wanna grow their own food, but they're, 
they're into a new life, we need to we need to honor what they want and give them what they want. And they will come and they will love being here. All right, thank you, Ed. So that concludes the question and answer portion of tonight's forum. Next, we will move into closing statements. I will give the candidates two minutes to collect their thoughts. And once we start, each candidate will have three minutes in which to make their closing statements. So while the candidates are thinking of what to say, I wanted to make a couple announcements. First of all, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. If you had a question that was not asked, uh, I apologize, we did not have time for it, but please feel free to stick around and ask the candidates that question in private after the forum. Secondly, this event uh, is being recorded and it will be available on Fairfield uh, Public Access uh, within a few days. Um, you can also see it online at fairfieldmediacenter.com. It will also be on YouTube. So just search Fairfield Media Center, FF Media Center. In a few days, you should be able to see uh, this performance. So t tell your friends if they weren't able to make it. Okay, so for the closing statements, the order we will go in is uh, Michael, Ed, Connie. So, uh, Michael, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out, and thank you for the organizers putting this on. You know, when Ed Malloy ran 18 years ago, there was, there was a tension in the community. There was, uh, the tension was that so many of the people in the community wanted the city to be more than it had been. It had been a city that really focused on infrastructure and focused on the, the bare necessities. And when Ed was elected, it really opened up uh, what was a bottleneck and all this expansion has happened. And we, we became a great place in 2006. And I talked to Ed about this and he said that was a really a turning point for the community where we weren't, we're no longer ashamed of our kind of diverse uh, population, but instead we're proud. And I feel like now there's a new tension. The tension is, it's generational. There are people my age and younger ready to get involved, ready to bring their ideas to the table, ready to be part of the conversation, and they're not being in invited. I go to the meetings, I'm, like I said, I'm usually the youngest person there, and I, I really don't understand that. I, I feel that we can train up the next generation, be inclusive, and help them take their place in our community as community leaders. So that is what I want to be as the mayor. I want to bridge the gap, not just between the generations, but also between the university and the town's folks. I'm a Midwesterner. I feel at home with everyone in our community. I feel I can bridge that gap as well. And to bridge a gap between those who have extra to give and the people who need it most. We have a very caring community. Uh, it's, there's not a lack of giving, not a lack of volunteering, but really identifying where those efforts and those funds could be best spent. So again, I'm for inclusivity. I'm for addressing those who are in most need so that we can include them in our, uh, in our giving and lift up everyone. And again, I've been on the council 10 years. I've been mayor pro tem for the last two years. This is an extension of what I've been doing. I've been training for this role for this time. I've been really training for this my entire life. And this will be a natural extension of all the hours and hours of work that I put into this community. And so I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Obviously, you're here because you care about Fairfield for person, reasons personal to you, but also that you care about your children. You care about what the next generation is going to have and how, what are we going to do with this community. I think we've been given, we are at, we are at an amazing cusp, not only as a community, but where the world is at right now. The world is searching for something they can believe in. I believe that Fairfield has, 
has a unique opportunity to fulfill a destiny that's not really available to anywhere else, at least in the United States and probably in the world. The combination of people that came here and the, the locals and that, that synergy that's happened and the knowledge. You know, we came here because we wanted to create something that was magnificent. I believe that we have that opportunity now. I think it's a unique opportunity. I think the uh, Alliant Energy opportunity is sim symptomatic of that. I think we can do anything. Um, I'm a student of human potential, and I've made it a life study. Buckminster Fuller said that if you oppose any system, don't waste any time in opposition, but create an alternative model, and if it's valuable, people will come to that, and you don't have to fight or destroy the old system. Dr. Wayne Dyer made a study of the power of intention and raised $150 million for public television, just telling people about how if they can use the power of intention to create what they want in their life. My proposal is, is that we use the power of intention and the inspiration of Buckminster Fuller to address every single area of our community. We can do this. It's gonna take us coming together, loving each other, bringing out the best in each other, and realizing that we can create whatever we want. Now we're gonna, yes, we're gonna do this for us. We're gonna benefit from this. We're gonna be blessed from this. But we're gonna show our children what can be done. And so they're gonna see it all. Children see everything. And when they see that we're taking responsibility and creating a new reality, then they're gonna be inspired so that they will be the next generation of leaders. In the process of coming together, we will deeply enrich our lives. We will celebrate our success together and we will create the most magnificent version of ourselves and our community. We will share our blessings with the world and we will fulfill our destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. All right, Connie, take us home. Okay, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for, to all the people who are gonna watch this on, on uh, TV and over the internet means you care, I appreciate that. Um, I hope to see more and more of you engaged and inspired to help the city council and the mayor be have the city become what you want it to be. To summarize, I wanna just tell you a few of my points again. I think the city's infrastructure, such as streets and sewer are basic. We need to continue to work on those. Police and fire responders need, or excuse me, first responders need full support. I am really concerned about the drug issues that we have in our town. Balanced budgets, integrity, transparency must continue and be upheld. I'd like to see us develop capital building funds for our future needs. This is recommended by the City uh, League of Cities. Review ordinances to facilitate diversified housing, affordable housing, and population growth that will expand the tax base. Update the strategic and go green plan into one plan. Strengthen our volunteer mentor programs, including grant, write, grant writing through a volunteer center. Strengthen our downtown retail with a cultural corridor to clear to the railroad depot. That's a long-term goal. Improve community, neighborhood beautification and safety. Work towards households above the poverty line. Fully endowed foundations to support the buildings that the city owns and the organizations that are so important to Fairfield and make us a great place to live, such as the Carnegie Museum, the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, the library, and the park and rec. This does not mean at all cutting any of their budgets. It means growing the foundations so that they can be better. We need to team up and identify our goals and plans, what we want to do as a community together, inspire individuals to buy into them and also our organizations, and be willing to invest their time and their energy to help. I appreciate and the fact that you're here and thank you for carefully considering these points 
and considering me as your next mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And with that, tonight's forum has come to a close. I'd like to thank our candidates for sharing their vision with us. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for sharing your evening with us. And once again, I'd like to thank the partners that made tonight's forum possible. The Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce, the Fairfield Economic Development Association, and the Southeast Iowa Union. Now I wrote in here, let's all drive home safely before it starts snowing, that's no longer possible. There's no sense in trying to beat the snow, it's already down, so just drive home safely. All right, have a good night, everyone.